said that magic lives everywhere. Like a beating drum inside your soul. Sometimes I look around, but I can't feel it. if I look really close. I'll see it strong and clear. feel very fulfilled after that film. You know? It's a very satisfying movie in so many ways. <laughs> um, we'll, let the, we'll let the credits roll. Yeah, it, we, yeah we like nature sounds. We like nature sounds. <laughs> um, like I said, this is the kind of film that you can see it over and over again, and every time you, you find something in it that you didn't see before. So this time I was focusing on the aesthetics. It is such a beautiful film. I mean, every frame of your film is framed. It's like intention. It's thought-provoking, and it's nuanced, and it's intentional at the same time, if that makes any sense. <laughs> um, and I know that your background is as a designer. But what, were, what, what are some of the feelings you were trying to evoke from the viewer with your aesthetic? I'll tell you that when I, when I first, first uh, you know, had thoughts and imaginations about this film, there, you know, I, I, I did not imagine it handheld, and I, didn't, I imagined everything on dollies and, and um, <laughs> couldn't afford it. It would have been a very different film totally different film and it was just you know in that process of letting go of, of these ideas there's a film called In the Mood for Love by Wong Kar Wai that I that I remember was the first Toronto Film Festival I had a film playing in and I saw that film that year and I was just like uh, wow I remember it was that film Sexy Beast and, and, and Requiem for a Dream that and I and I and I was just like man I want to do what they do um, but the aesthetic, you know, the cinematographer that I worked with, um, I have to give a lot of credit to him because he's very experienced and he's very, he was challenging me in my level of confidence in terms of, you know, there's, when you're working within uh, certain uh, institutions, they want options, they want coverage, thing called coverage. And, um, and you know, and when I first had this original plan with this film, it was supposed to breathe. and you know, with composed frames. And, um, you know, they fought me to get more coverage. And the, my cinematographer was fighting me to not do coverage. So, but he, I, I wasn't at that level yet to, 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 um, to handle sequences like that, I believed. So it became a mixture of things. Um, it, this cinematographer, he's a very uh, organic, um, he has an amazing soul. So basically he would watch scenes with me and we would talk about them and he wouldn't even he wouldn't even hold the camera or look through the frame yet like but I do a lot of sketches and I do a lot of things before I go so it's almost like we do our it's like learning your dialogue before you're and you know everything before you go out on stage to a play and then we let and then we leave the script alone and then we actually go by what the people are doing and he has this amazing sensibility where he can 
he can move with the camera and and it kind of zeroes in on emotions in a certain way and uh, I wanted this this is films dedicated to my I don't know if you the the the, the four women in my life which is uh, my three older sisters and my my mom and my middle sister, she's the, she has sickle cell anemia, and um, this guy was able to just sink into it in a certain way. And um, the question, the frames had to be were trying to be capture emotion, you know, and even the color schemes. I mean, it's interesting watching DVD in here and stuff. And if you watch it home, and it's different than you watch on the big the R35 print, it's different. Yeah. And there is something uh, I initially conceived this film as being black and white with black people, um, and some of them spoke French in the original draft, and it terrified everybody in Canada. <laughs> It, it's like black people don't speak French. We can't make a black and white film. We can't blah blah blah. So I said, all right, you don't want black and white. I want to go with heavy color. And and if you see the real, like you know, I, I really push the color because I also believe that color evokes emotions. And the colors, are, you really do need to see it with 35 yeah. print. It is beautiful. It is just something to behold. I mean, it even comes across, even though this, you know. No, this is great. I wasn't it criticizing it. No, 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 no. But, and but, um, believe me, I'm not, um, you know, this is no big deal to me. But this, at least having it on a big screen is helpful. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. But I do believe that, you know, we really miss something by not being able to see your film theatrically released. Yeah, and that's kind of a disappointing thing. And that's what you want, and you make something for, you know, this was my first feature film, so it was really, you know, the objective was to get it theatrically released, and, and in Canada did its thing, and here it kind of did a little, little things, and, um, and you know, but did it, but, it's it holds to you know DVDs and stuff, but the colors. I mean, when you watch it at another time, if you do, um, or even go to iTunes and if you do want it there, you you, you watch on your little monitor, your little s computer screen, and you the colors. The colors are incredible, oh. really. Um, because, anyways, yeah. So it was an emotional um, sort of uh, way we were approaching the frames and 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 the color schemes and the aesthetic of it. That was really and it was bare bones. I mean, I made this film for five hundred thousand dollars Canadian uh, dollars, and uh, and it was uh, it was a huge it was a huge undertaking in terms of you know uh, abandoning a lot of things that you had dreamt about you know mm. but then it's amazing what actually comes out you know so the core of it is intact way intact thank you <laughs> she's so kind about this when i saw her the first time i was like huh i was a crying one. <laughs> i was, was just crying. kind of crying <laughs> yeah. cry. um the other thing that that i thought about when i watched the film this time was the, the your casting choices First of all, he just want to take Seal home. I mean, he was incredible. How did you find this little guy is amazing. He just finished a f he just finished Moby Dick with Ethan wow. Hawke and uh, William Hurt. He's now doing this uh, hush hush Steven Spielberg TV series that's about to drop very soon. What? But this kid, uh, when I met him, oh, when he did this film, he was he was just turning 12, and I was so lucky because in the in the Actra Union, our SAG equivalent, uh, anyone under 12, you you have a certain amount of hours to work with them and I originally wrote this character to be nine years old and uh, and um, and that shot our days up to like 47 <laughs> which we could never afford to do so jacked it up and then this and I thought I was going to get all these options because I was really looking for a non-actor um, and you know I thought we were going to get all these options for the 12 year old age range but only four boys showed up mm. and one of them God bless him it was East Indian Oh. I mean, this was a this is what was going on. So I had three options. <laughs> this little guy comes in, and about four years prior, I was making a short film, and he auditioned for it. Hmm. And this kid walks in, and, and he just hugs me as soon as he walks in, and and, and remembered everything from that first time we met. Wow. And um, he's the type of kid that he didn't. Even, you know, he got on the floor. He was doing all this work. Uh, he's very tactile. You can, and the way he is with his mother, 
is how he it's is. With, yeah. Like this kid, I mean, he's he's a little money bags kid. This kid is, I mean, you've heard him. Now he's like, um, he's older now, and all the ladies and the money he's making. And <laughs> but the thing is, is that even with all the loot that he makes, he's like, I only want a PSP. And he basically, Mom, what do you want? <laughs> Dad, what do you want? Brother, sister, what do you want? And he's got like five brothers and sisters. Wow. He gives it up. He's he's got the biggest soul. And the crazy. You, someone mentioned Justin Bieber today in our in our thing. Sorry. And I gotta, you know, it's because Canadian guys, you know, gotta <laughs> Drake, you know, Bieber. But this kid, I'll tell you, pound for pound, will smoke him. Oh, okay. This kid is so damn talented. He has a band with that he performs. He's been offered record contracts when he was 12, and nobody told executives. It's not conscious enough. Oh wow! <laughs> they want to make him a pop star, and he's like, "I won't do it. I won't do it." And I was like, "Are you crazy?" <laughs> no, <laughs> dude, we can no. Um, uh, 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 I wouldn't. Have, no, I didn't do that. But the kid is is a uh, different breed. Clark Johnson, who you might know Clark. from The Wire, he's also a very acclaimed uh, film director. Does every TV show that you'll see. I just I just was talking to him the other day, and he's like, "Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, blah blah blah." I said, "You know, I was last time I was just in New York a couple of weeks ago, and." Uh, and uh, and I when only when I'm away I get to watch TV so I'm watching and I I watch like uh, oh shit these shows I can't white collar and blah 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 and I see him I I, saw, I watched three shows that week and his name was on all these cr- I was like dude anyways he did SWAT and he did the Sentinel he's done. He's been a mentor. I've acted with, I played his son uh, uh, in this film. I've worked with him as an actor about four times. Uh, Because he's the type of guy that will come back and give things back. This guy didn't, he, it wasn't a lot of money, but I mean, to me, it's a lot of money. It was about $17,000 he was getting paid to make this film. He didn't take a cent. He was cutting. He just finished. We, I waited eight months for him because I had a window to work with him, and then the final season of The Wire came, and then he was directing and acting wow. that, in the final season. So I had to wait for him. But this guy was cutting his, his, the, the final episodes and stuff, and then flying back to Toronto on his own dime to work on this film. Wow. He was back and forth, but he's done so much. Um, and he's a guy that keeps me in check. Like when, you know, I'm complaining and all the filmmakers are complaining about how hard it is and these guys don't understand me and they're, they're taking my script and doing all this shit. He basically went upstairs when I was at his house this one time. He went up and he came back with what looked like a script. And he put it on the, on the table. I'm like, oh, what is this? And he goes, these are my, my focus notes that I got from the studio. <laughs> for the Sentinel. Wow. So if you want to go make your film, you'd be happy right now because you think that it's going to get easier. You think it's going to be this thing and a guy of his stature, but he's getting like all these notes. He's like, Charles, this isn't even my film anymore. And at least you have this. So he was like, uh, so a rule that he told me is, is write what they want to hear at times. Keep your script. When you're on the floor, shoot what you need, shoot what you want. But always remember that when you're in the editing room that the, the heads are going to poke back in. So have options in a certain way. But when you're on the floor, it's your floor. No one can say anything to you. So, so you can change your dialogue. You can do whatever. He, his motive is get the money to make your movie, and then you have your time. But always know that it's going. They're going to come back. Uh, Karen LeBlanc, beautiful actress. This woman, uh, she does a lot of t- television. I mean, she was uh, Defying amazing. Gravity, all these shows. Uh, but she's never been cast in a lead role in a feature film before. This was her first. And that's another thing. It's like, you know, again, like uh, that I was saying, like, don't forget us Canadian black folks um, or whatever, is that there's a community and there's some extremely, there's some amazing talent that, that um, don't, do not get the opportunity as they do not hear. Like Jamie Hector is another guy from The Wire who uh, we'll be working with next. And, and, you know, when I sent him that script, he was like, no one sent me something like this. And I'm mm. like, I know. I know. So it's like, uh, you know, people write for Tom Hanks. People write for Tom Cruise. People write for Colin Farrell. They write for all these guys, which I respect and think are great. But if we're not writing specifically for these actors and these performers that we see, that we think have a great range, and, um, and all the little boys and all the little boxers, like right now they're around 16, 
and they're like uh, the next wave of, of, of champions in Canada. They are, um, the guy that fights Clark Johnson, he's an Olympian, he's, uh, his name is Chris Johnson, and, um, and he trains these kids. And he's a former Olympian, his story's amazing, like he, he's, he, he was a professional boxer, but these are non-actors. And the young guy that played the older boy in the gym, he's, we have this place in Ontario called Stratford Theatre. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's like the biggest is where Christopher Plummer comes every sure. year and all these. He, after this film, he, they, he was still in school. They took him. Wow. So now he's, the, he's like the only black kid at Stratford, you know, for the season. And they're doing Shakespeare, mm -hmm. okay? So the talent is there, and uh, I'm really I love the I love the cat I love them. And the little girl, she's oh, she's yeah. gone. She awesome. Like that little girl, it was her first role, and and she was just magical. It was I wanted to uh, cast either you know Latino or Italian young girl, and then I got this thing. Uh, I got, List, the list of names on the list, and I read Samantha Summer Wilson. I got so pissed at the casting people. I'm like, that's not Italian, that's not Spanish, <laughs> or whatever. And then she actually told it's her father's last name, so she's mixed, right? So she's half, whatever. But she was the best actress. She was the best. And the chemistry between the two of them, oh, God, the kids, those two was, men, they were so amazing. they were uh, they were very competitive. Yeah. Oh, wow. They were amazing, but really? they were so competitive. There was this love thing going on, yeah. and, and for real. <laughs> and, and and, and you see that. But when they were like, you know, because he would sing and then she'd sing. They're like these two triple. <laughs> so he'd start dancing. Like he'd do an emotional scene and then you call cut and then he's like. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then she sees that then she starts challenging him I'm like guys 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 <laughs> your mom's dying no <laughs> anyways yeah I'm talking too much no you're not at all questions comments I know people are gonna have some I can always keep asking questions yeah. but I want to give you guys a chance where you go wait let's wait for here we come Mike to your right <laughs> Well, thank you so much. It was just so wonderful, and I'm so glad that I stayed. And uh, it's just I'm so impressed. Um, I wonder how wide it's been distributed, you know, in America and in other part of the con the world. Yeah, uh, again, yeah, this is what this whole thing's about, right? <laughs> it's okay because you know I was I'm very fortunate because it was an institution that I was the Canadian Film Center, which was created by Norman Jewison, and I was lucky enough in 2002 to become a resident there. They take like five directors a year, and I was very fortunate. And this film was produced by that same entity. They have a feature film program, so we, you know. The Canadian distribution was was cool. I got to play in about seven different places in Canada. Canada's where I'm from, and that's, you know, so um, Mongrel Media is a great um, distributor. Um, the film was acquired by Rezo Films, a company in Paris, at the Toronto Film Festival in 2008. Um, but um, they didn't do a lot. It was the only, it was like the second Canadian film they've ever taken. They took fantastic. So, but um, they're doing a lot with his film. Um, <laughs> but it's like the fact that they they actually they were like you know we want you to come to Paris and make your aesthetic and blah 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 and, and that's still in the works. But I was like, but what about this film? You know. So there was these ideas that they're they're building relationships that they might not do a lot with your film, but they're trying to build a relationship with you, but I think that kind of messes up the relationship, <laughs> you know? So there's, I don't want to work with you in that capacity now, because I saw what you just did. But they or didn't do. Or didn't do, exactly. Um, so I'm a little disappointed with that area, because there was even festivals that were coming. There was this idea that I experienced that everyone wants to bank things, like when, you know, you had this launch, or like the Toronto Film Festival, um, and there's this competition where, you know, so um, you're thinking about the theatrical release the distributors are. So they, they actually ask for less screens during the film festival so that people miss the film. The press that you get, they want to bank it and hold it back until it gets released in the theater. And I'm like, wait, no one knows who the hell I am. <laughs> like, what, who are you banking this stuff for? Let people know. So I had my risk with, with that sort of process, but that process was, was happening with our international sales agent because the film was getting requested by a lot of festivals in America mm -hmm. that I wanted to go to. Like, they even offered me to give me some money for a prize before I got there, and, I, and they said no. They said no um, because we don't want to overexpose the film. 
I'm like, it hasn't played there yet. <laughs> How do you overexpose something if it hasn't played? And you know, and I, I've had my my issues with that. And then it was, you know, film movement was on it. I was here. I had a great screening at, at a MoMA um, in 2009 as well. And I mean, this film is kind of not old, but it's it's been through the thing in a certain way. And if it, you hadn't seen it in theaters, it's not going to get there now. So this was kind of saying earlier that a theatrical release is kind of an event in a way. And if you can plan around the event and make it most exciting that people, you know, that people, when that's done, people, it's in their consciousness. But Film Movement wanted this film. And um, we met with Oscilloscope. We met with, uh, you know, uh, IFC. Like, folks wanted it. But again, it was like, the return was was absolutely like n nothing, yeah. you know. And then and then we played at Sarasota and it won some awards there. And then it was like and then filming came back and then it was like finally it worked out. But I'll tell you, it took about nine months for that deal to happen. Mm. And it was also at the time when the client was really horrible. Like I remember, like I was hanging with this filmmaker who made a film called Hunger, and he's a British filmmaker. And and his film was just getting released with IFC. And he was and he was telling me, dude, like it's not even good. And 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 he won like massive. I mean, the film's out of this world. And he was like, yeah, it's, I don't know, you know, it's, it's still hedging, but they acquired it. So uh, I think that, you know, now that I've got two under my belt, I have different ideas. You have to go through to understand some things. I don't think it's, it's wise to abandon or if you don't have an opportunity to, you, you know, to go through that route. I built, you know, I'm still like Rebecca, I still like these folks at, at Film Movement, and I understand their climate of business, but I'm, I still kind of weaseling and say, you know what you need to hire? You need to hire one other person that handles just these kinds of films. Mm -hmm. It's almost like an agent or uh, whatever, it's like, or a record label when they have like, you know, or, or like, I, I, my example is like Warner Independent. You know, like it's another stream yes. or it's another tier, but distributors don't do that. No. They just take everything, you know, not everything, but they take stuff. And also, they're building a, a bank, like, of, of, they'll take, they have to acquire X amount of films so that they can sell them mm -hmm. as a block in a way. In a way, do they care about the film? I don't know. I think that the people we worked with did care about the film in a certain way, but in terms of getting it out and, and the sort of monetary things, this film was bought, <laughs> the weirdest thing, it's made the most money and it was in, a, in the Middle East and has been bought there. What? It's crazy to me. In India, sorry, as well. And, and Go figure, broadcast? right? Broadcast? Broadcast, yeah. Yeah. I don't wow. understand it. Interesting. I'm like, who, what? They want to watch this there and subtitle it? and Actually, and do all we this had a sale, Daughters of the Dust, in Saudi Arabia as well. Interesting. Mm -hmm. it's, exactly. Well, yeah. and it's, it's kind of weird to me. But I think we should be creating events for this film to be seen. What do you say? Yeah. That would be awesome. I, I'm still, I, I don't think it's dated at all. I think there's some issues in there that are very relevant. The whole sickle cell thing. When have you heard a film about a film about sickle cell? Come on. I, I wish I know, my friend LaShawn was still here. LaShawn Williams who works for Harlem Hospital. Come on. We could do a whole health thing around the issue of sickle cell. Yes. Um, Ava's film, she tapped into the breast cancer with, Absolutely. with the cancer society. Absolutely. We talk about that. It's almost like we, we, this stuff doesn't exist with us. Like, yeah. you, know, you know, mental health, like these things that are really really important and I especially like you know it was amazing like um, going to Seattle Film Festival which is part of a firm um, mm -hmm. and stuff and I mean everywhere I've gone that have been people that have been interesting in Toronto I, I do a lot of work with, for the Sickle Cell Association already before I made the film so I'm you know mm -hmm. but they teamed up with us and I still keep uh, they keep it going um, so when it was played at the Langston Hughes it was it was all about the Sickle Cell event it was amazing they had they had youth, like young folks, and seeing the diaspora, there was Latino folks involved in there too. Like there's people that, people are not talking about this. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they were young, and it was crazy. This one kid wrote, read this poem that he wrote to his girlfriend, and how, and this guy was about 16 years old, and, and, and it just basically was how she, she, she's given him a reason to continue fighting and living because when he goes, when he has his crises, like mm -hmm. this kid, he, he just wants to shoot himself, and um, and it's just moving stuff. But I think it's like, yeah, just get it talking, you know, and not just on this downer medical stuff. It's like, how do we live with it? Gaia, you know? sorry. 
I mean, jumping right on the. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on, quick, quick. <laughs> I just, it's just one word, and not to keep be beating the same drum, but I mean, Sickle Cell West Africa, um, with the African Film Acad Academy and the, and the Amas, um, two years ago we had a whole theme around that. And just speaking on Michelle's point of creating events around that, I mean, that's, there's the highest incidence of uh, sickle cell in Africa for obvious reasons. Absolutely. And I think that would resonate. I, I, mean, I mean, not that the movies, I mean, it's so much more than that, but talking but it's about a way, it's a, it's, vehicles, it's a, it's a yes. way to Absolutely. create events and Absolutely. actually get people out and create conversation and to see a movie. Like, Absolutely. you have to find, I think, some of those things that you can attach your film to, obviously, that brings community together, right? right? And definitely. How would, would film movement respond to something like that? I, I think they'd be open. I think they'd be open and um, we should talk we then. So we, you know, should, figure out we how, should talk with them. I'm because, definitely down to help them get this. Oh, that'd be amazing. Absolutely. I would love to do just one event in New York City that, you know, the sickest, because I know, I mean, I, I just want I you all to folks. see this film on 35. It's just incredible. That would Seriously. be amazing too. One more time. I'd love to do Absolutely. one more time. <laughs> I, 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 will to I can totally get on them and it, but the weird thing again with distributors too and you know in a way I want to be one in a certain way just to show them that I think I know better. Well that's what Frances Ann says. And that's, that's what, what it is. She, yeah that's and, what she and, did. And you know did. I have some things I can't manage that right now but um, but the, the thing is is that uh, you know I just really really wish that that <laughs> it's I don't know I think that it's um, it's just a, it's just a shame that they take stuff in a way, you know, and I understand that that you get, they've got their slates of stuff for the year, and, and they're and they're distributing maybe Sony Picture Classic stuff too, or whatever, and this bigger stuff. But but there is, you know, I'm willing to do the legwork. Yes, I'm willing to do the legwork, and Same and here. we can team <laughs> with that. And then the, and then the film has a window with a distributor, because it's almost like okay, that month we're all we're that's, who are you again? Yeah, like we're already on to the next film, and and um and that's hard. It is. Yeah, Jamila. Um, just kind of segueing into more about the, the story as a whole, I know Sickle Cell was a major part of the themes, but what other themes, like when you sat down to write this story, what story did you want to tell, in your own words? Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I, wa I want to talk about the absentee men. I want to talk about our us number one is a society where some people were like when they read this script or they they're like this happens too fast why the hell does this happen I was like have you ever not fallen in love with somebody and gone nuts in a certain way <laughs> have you uh, why is it a question that now in our present day 2011 that if a child is abandoned that we question whether we look after that child or not I don't know him there was a time in our community specifically speaking someone falls away people take care of the kid why is that lo and, and so a lot of the powers that be that were reading and funding and taking me through my story reading sessions have nothing to do with and don't understand certain things in a certain way and that's evident and and you're in a very vulnerable place of trying to get a film made and you give up stuff that you shouldn't and stuff uh, but you learn from the experience but uh, that was one of the major things it's like if 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 my child if I happen to be a single father or whatever and something happens and and some people don't have have a family support system. system right? They don't. Not everyone has that. Mm -hmm. And and so what then? Then what happens? Mm -hmm. What happens to the? You know, a big question of like you know what happens when a when a when when someone is incarcerated and they have a child. You know what happens to that child? Like it, does it end there? Like where does this go? So that was one of the major things that I was I really want to get at as well. And I just want to, a role for a, a black woman mm -hmm. to to show herself, show a range, and not be, again, like, you know, this film was really, really specific for, for women. That's, that was my audience, honestly. I'm not disregarding you folks, but that, that's my audience. And, um, and then my niece comes in there too. But, but, these, but these four women were why I made it, and because I, as a kid, I dreamt about the superhero man showing up at this doorstep to look after my mom, the fighter. 
Mm. I wanted that dude to show up one day. Mm. She's, you know, she's never had that. Um, I wanted, you know, my sisters who are all single mothers. Mm. Um, I want, I, I want, I still want that for them. And um, and so I wanted to show them that uh, I've been thinking about them in a certain way. And and hopefully that, you know, my niece is going to look for a certain kind of man. He may not have the best apartment. He may not whatever. But if he's willing to step up, look after your child, and do certain things, and fight for you, mm. that's cool. And it's also a reminder to me. I made this film to remind me about the way I've seen some females treated and how I have to remember that, that I, I got to choose my fights because I can get really emotional and say some wrong things at the wrong times. And, uh, but it's a, it's, and that's another theme. It's like, what are we fighting for here? Like, what is it? When you, every day, you know, what are we fighting for? Like, picking and choosing those things. We only have so much time and so much energy. So there's, there's quite a bit. There's quite a bit. But that's, I think, that hopefully that answers. And it awesome. all comes through. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, right here. <laughs> Jodine. Hi, um, my question, first of all, that was so beautiful and I think it's going to stay with me for a while. I'm like still tearing up, but um, my question is about kind of the mysticism elements and is that Wicca or what, where, where does that come from? What is the origin of that? And also the music, um, how did you go about choosing the songs and, and the music's incredible and it? piecing it and piecing it into the narrative I'm just curious to see like how that came about right and, and it's sort of a part of the it's story character it's absolutely yeah. a, sto- a character and also because you know it's being controlled by the characters in the film yeah. and that was you know when I write I cannot write without music and so when I when I was writing this in the first you know I mean I had a, a file of about 300 songs that I loved just loved and and then as that list start to really wheel its way down because I was acting as I was writing and thinking about what would come from the characters and then that list got to about 50 songs <laughs> and then and then and then there were some things I just couldn't acquire because the artist was we couldn't afford it um, um, so the music was I definitely wanted to make something that I don't see films I love dub reggae I love I love that music I love I love it and um, just yeah and the beats and the you know that echo fader and these things and and I hadn't seen that a lot in films and so I was like okay so people in Toronto and there's this massive Jamaican population there and you know we have Carabana if you've heard of it it's pretty big and and I was like how come no one's ever really done this in Canada in a certain way they, they, they'll use a song by Bob Marley oh yeah okay <laughs> sure and if you can get that no disrespect but I mean right. it's like come on there's like Mikey so Dredd and God bless people. Mikey Dredd who passed away the year and I built this great relationship with his wife and, and he, was, he was going through cancer battles at the time and I was just able to get him copies of stuff and and I built these like guys were in the bush in Jamaica that had to had to like it was crazy to get to them and what I also learned through that process was that how ripped off these guys got they were so excited that they were getting a little check for some of this stuff like they these guys have made excellent music Anytime you, you kind of put a thought out there, remember those, uh, you put thought, you manifest things. We do it. We're doing it right now. You, you know what I mean? Like you're, sec- you're listening to me right now, but you're, you're, you're also thinking something else. You also got something else going on in your head too, or you zone in and out or whatever. And those sort of things that we put out are like, and once you start to speak them and, and, and ma- where's the magic in our, in our culture? We've all, we see a lot of, well, I have. I mean, I, it was, it was, you know, Denzel Washington was a Academy Award for Training Day, you know. Uh, um, Terrence Howard was in, has been a phenomenal actor before Hustle and Flow. Phenomenal, if you've seen his work before. But somehow the folks are credited in a certain way. And, and I wanted to see black people live and they talk about magic. Like, and there's magic happening in their life. Right. Um, you know, we need more magic. And um, yeah, d- uh, that was the music. And, uh, yeah, I think I answered your question. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, okay, last, okay, last two questions. <laughs> I just want to say I definitely enjoyed the film, and also in regards to Canada, 
back in 2002, I was actually in Calgary and Edmonton. Okay. Very beautiful cities. Also a wonderful mall in Edmonton. Oh, yeah. West, Ed <laughs> West Edmonton Mall, man. Yes. Huge. Yes. Love the waterfall there, too. Or up there, slide. It's everything. But um, also, I was just wondering, uh, since, since this film has been released, what has been the greatest award for you personally uh, upon seeing this thing come to completion? Huh. That my sister survived to see it. Uh, she's been, I was, one big pressure for me was there's, through the process of writing and, 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 and trying to make the film and the waiting that goes in, into it, I was so terrified that my sister wasn't going to make it through because she, she struggles with it every day, you know, and she's getting older. She's a survivor, but she's, you know, it could happen. So that was really the, the biggest thing at Toronto Film Festival, our, our, our premiere screening and, and having her there with her son. And um, um, because she was a real inspiration. I mean, she got pregnant when she was when she turned thirty. When she she was told when she was seventeen that she wasn't going to live past thirty by a doctor. Like imagine that. <laughs> and uh, and then um, she decided to get pregnant at thirty. And um, and we you know it caused a rift with my my other sisters and my mom because it's like life and death. But she wanted to be able to have an opportunity to leave something behind if that was the case. Um, and uh, I'm just telling you this because you asked me a certain question, just led into this. And uh, so she basically uh, had this boy, I was with her th all through pregnancy, and then she was staying with me, and this little guy was sleeping in bed with me, and I was like, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? Am I gonna have to look after this little boy? And that's pretty much what we've been preparing for anyways. But the thing is, is um, at that time, I was like much younger and thinking like, what the hell am I going to do? I mean, I can't have girls come over anymore. I can't, you know, anyways, but, uh, but that's my biggest reward. And then, you know, uh, yeah, the, and, and actually, in, in, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. There's more, but that's, that's, a good, that's the biggest one. Last question right here. Thanks. I just want to say thanks for coming and making it here. I'm from Vancouver, so it's nice to meet you. Are you? Yeah. I just made a film about Harry Jerome. Do you know the guy, Stanley Park? Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah. See? You know the statue, but you don't know, know who he statue. is. I was just thinking about it's that amazing. statue. It's amazing. I do. It's amazing. From a cool. mile. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's my thanks. It's mind-boggling that you had so much trouble getting it released. I just I don't understand. You know, I saw the King's speech, and I saw this, and I... I don't understand <laughs> why. Wow. That's no, huge. I, I don't That's know. <laughs> that, that was amazing. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to ask you specifically, um, you know, in total there's like four people who die in this movie. Uh, were you concerned about having so much sadness in one movie? Secondly, I want to ask you about the the space of the kid in their, in their apartment. I thought it was interesting how he was, had his own space tucked away. It took me a bit to figure out what was going on there. I just want to hear a bit more about it. I also want to mention that if you do have another showing in New York, I work at the New School and I'll gladly volunteer to, to help out. So, ah, yeah. shit. Right. That's amazing. Thank you. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll just work backwards over because the other one's fresh. The, the boy in the geography, uh, I had originally written uh, that they lived in this uh, store for, above a storefront, and it was hell trying to find that location. Believe it or not, I thought it was like the easiest location to find. And then um, the production designer, her father, who I've, she's a friend from high school actually, and um, uh, her father's just like, I call him like, the, you know, the Toronto Donald Trump. He owns all these little houses and places around the city. And I, whenever I have, I'm in trouble with the location, I call this man. And he tells me, well, Charles, I got this house and uh, you should go look at it and just see because we're going to tear it down. You can do whatever you want in this house because we're going to tear it down. I thought, perfect set. I go there. He didn't tell me certain things about the house, but I see this hole in the wall. And I'm like, we're shooting here. <laughs> Because originally I'm like, I'm putting the wardrobe here, we got our back thing and everything. And um, it was a grow up. It was like this hole in the wall and there were holes on the floor. The house was actually condemned. And he got it for a real bargain basement price, but I didn't know. So I'm here like, we're taking this location. I love it. And then he starts telling me the story. This is how they were shipping the drugs through the, the hole in the wall to their vehicles. And then it was unbelievable, this place. And then the city steps in when they find out that I want to shoot there. And, and I had to 
fight so hard for them to let me let us shoot there because the house was condemned and then there was and it was a, it was a health hazard I had to, we had to pay to like the mold from the basement there were still buckets of there were still like there was there was there was still stuff down there <laughs> I won't tell you what we did with that but <laughs> but 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 there was stuff still there and it was amazing and um, and so that was Another thing of just being inspired by a location when you're going to a place and being open, sometimes you don't find exactly what you want, but then somehow you, you, you use it. And, um, and then the other question was, shit. Or nuts. Or nuts. You, you know, I'm a morbid guy. <laughs> I just, you know what, I really, well, my biggest fear is not so much about me personally dying, it's just how I'm going to handle when people die around, you know, people I really love. And, and, uh, Death has been a, a theme <laughs> that's been going on because I think for my own self, it's a little bit of a therapy thing. Um, there's a lot of gun, I hit to a lot of things. I mean, in Toronto, there's a heavy flux of gun violence going on uh, with the shower posse, the folks, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I work with a lot of these youth as well. And I've, and I've lost a couple along the way. And so the kid that, 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 that dies in the, on the table, um, that is a, that's about, the, that's about four, four characters in there. And, and without going into the whole thing about all that stuff, you see the bullet hole, you understand things. It's, it's like, it's a real threat to a young black boy in Toronto, believe it or not, uh, the gun violence. So the, that death, horse, you know, it was the old guy. I mean, it, you know, sometimes, you know, for that line, it's like so, something happens to you that wakes you up to change your life which is the effect that happened with, with silence. This guy has never fulfilled his potential. That's why in the first little, he's never fulfilled his potential. It takes his mentor to pass away for him to actually step up and do something. You know, the mother dying, it's my, that's my biggest fear. I want to know how the hell I'm going to cope with it. So I wrote about it. You know, the kid freaking out and everything. I, yeah, that's me, man. If that, had, like, I don't know what, you know, so it's those sort of, Things are, are, were just real thoughts. And it's not to be, we gotta deal with death. And, but in the end, it's like, you know, there, is, there was a man who stepped up to look after this kid. The, the kid understood something about going through, he became a man, he comes out of the water and he comes out, he becomes transformed through death as well. He understands love in a different way. And um, so death is necessary for us to understand a lot of things, you know. So that's why. I don't know how to begin to thank you, Charles. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> I'm so yeah, glad you were me. able to come. Give me a break. Well, yes. your thank work. you so much. Thank, thank you, you for your work and for your... Thank you for staying and watching and... And, and, and I, I just want to make two announcements. One is, uh, you know, the African Film Festival is going on right now. It uh, started on Friday. I, I, I've lost track of the week. What day is it? When did it start? Saturday. Today's Saturday. Today's Saturday. Yeah. It started Wednesday. Sheila Walker's film is playing on Thursday. I'm going to be moderating her panel up at Columbia. Um, and we have brochures out front with the whole schedule. I encourage you to go. This only happens once a year. Mm. Please, please, please support. Um, this is just the beginning. And I hope all of you will be come along on the journey with us to make this continue to happen. Please make sure you sign our sign-up sheets. Please make sure you check back to, to our Facebook page. I hate saying that, but we'll try and do that other thing Dwayne said, whatever that thing is you said we should do. Okay, we'll do that too. And, um, um, but really, this is just the beginning. And I, I don't know if you guys are serious about helping us to do something with Charles's film here, but I'm, no, I'm serious because I think it's, it's, it warrants it and then some. Thank but you. thank you. Thank you all so much for coming. And Sheila? That's right. Ooh. <laughs> Little turn of events there. We like that. That sounds good. But again, th I have to thank my team Kiri, Ehoma, Jamila, Tamika. Oh, gosh. Who else is there? Indalea, uh, Pam Tillis, who is never in the room, Nihal, who was on my camera over here, Emily, Dan. Shani, I just met, and she's been amazing. Uh, Ann Bennett is always amazing. Thank you guys so much for all your help. I could not have done it without you, and thank you.
Thank you.